I've gotten into trouble over the years concerning my definition of sci-fi. So let's clear some things up once and for all. By modern genre conventions, science fiction falls under the umbrella of speculative fiction, a catch-all term that includes fantasy, sci-fi, supernatural horror, magical realism, and a few other subgenres concerned with speculating about what the world would be like if the rules of reality were tweaked. Sci-fi itself is subdivided into so-called hard and soft sci-fi, with hard sci-fi adhering more closely to scientific realism, and soft sci-fi leaning more in the direction of fantasy. It's Jules Verne versus H.G. Wells, Arthur C. Clarke versus Isaac Asimov, Star Trek versus Star Wars, etc. Therefore, I defend my definition of sci-fi under the broadest possible terms, even including the most basic natural sciences so that things like Godzilla and One Million Years BC qualify. If you don't like that definition, please feel free to tell me in the comments. The algorithm loves engagement, but don't expect me to change my mind on the matter. This all brings me, in a roundabout sort of way, to today's film, a surprising bit of cinema from the silent era that falls well in the hard sci-fi camp, and one that allows me to return to one of my favorite founding fathers of big-budget spectacle, the legendary Fritz Lang. entrepreneur Helios and the disgraced scientist Professor Manfelt set out to visit the far side of the moon, joined by Helios' assistant Vindiger and his fiancée Frida, only to be sabotaged by wealthy elites and their nefarious spy, who intend to make sure the moon belongs only to them. Helios launches his experimental rocket, but once they all reach the lunar surface, things immediately begin to spiral out of control. What will they find in the alien caverns of our celestial neighbor? What will they do with the spy in their midst? And can they repair their ship in time to make it home alive? In 1923, the physics student Hermann Oberth published a controversial book called The Rocket into Interplanetary Space, based on his own doctoral dissertation on the subject of rocketry. Inspired by the works of Jules Verne, he had been fascinated by the subject since he was a small child, even creating his own model rocket when he was only 14. His book was considered somewhat fringe and utopian, but it caught the attention of German filmmaker Fritz Lang, who had just finished the first of his Dr. Mabuse trilogy, Dr. Mabuse the Gambler. Years later, after the completion of Metropolis, Long and his wife Thea von Arbo worked together to craft a movie based around the idea of a rocket to the moon, only instead of playing it for simple fantasy like George Méliès' famous A Trip to the Moon, they strove for as much scientific accuracy as possible. Thea von Arbo writing the novel upon which the film would be based, consulted the best scientific books and papers she could find, while Fritz Lang hired Hermann Oberth himself, now a professor and founding member of Germany's newly formed Society of Space Travel, to be the film's technical and scientific advisor. Despite cooling relations between Long and production studio Universum Film, or UFA, following the financial disaster of Metropolis, Ufa did agree to help fund Oberth's own rocket experiments as part of the deal, which included building the first liquid fuel prototype that was planned to launch on the day of the film's premiere. Oberth then brought in Rudolf Nabel as an assistant, along with a handful of others, including a then 18-year-old Werner von Braun. Hey! Do you have a sci-fi classic you want me to cover? 
why don't you drop it in the comments below. And while you're there, don't forget to hit those like and subscribe buttons. If you'd like to support what I do even more, please consider joining my Patreon to get access to bonus content, vote on future topics, and more. I'm also the co-host of a couple of different podcasts, The Streaming Heap and From Here to Paternity, and I have a novel called Paradox that is available through Amazon. If all else fails, though, you can always check out my website at emcgill.com, where you'll find written reviews of plenty more sci-fi classics in both film and literature. Now then, with all that shameless self-promotion out of the way, let's move on. Filming on Frau im Mond, or Woman in the Moon as I'll call it from now on, began in October of 1928 at Ufa Studios in Neubabelsberg. Though most films in production in Germany at the time were taking advantage of sound, Long was steadfast in opposition, believing that his movie would only work as a silent one. The lunar landscape was created in studio with 40 quote-unquote train wagons of sand taken from the Baltic Sea and specially roasted to achieve the correct whitish color. The landing capsule, called a space airship, stood at 12 meters tall and was painted black and white on either side. It also had a working hermetically sealing hatch in the middle. One of the most difficult challenges on this set was lighting it as diffusely as possible, because directional light ruined the illusion of being on an alien world removed from human technology. Another major challenge was carefully sweeping away footsteps and other impressions in the delicate sand between takes. The model of the moon seen from orbit was constructed by hand out of plaster sculpted around a large drum, and the launching scene was accomplished with extensive models that, while obviously miniatures, are still pretty impressive. For the moon scenes, the cast was outfitted with thick cork-lined shoes, which were meant to look like lead, which would presumably combat the lower gravity. This is just one example of the film's operating ethos, in that it strove for complete scientific accuracy according to what was known in 1928. Even the most obviously fictitious aspects like there being atmosphere and gold on the far side of the moon were actually based on real scientific papers, not nearly as fringe as you'd expect. It is worth noting, though, that Hermann Oberth would complain about the breathable atmosphere as being the most unrealistic aspect of the story. The scientific accuracy is probably what makes the film so remarkable, even today, given that it showcased and even invented a few aspects of space travel that would go on to become very real in the decades that followed. Fritz Long himself is credited as the inventor of the launch countdown, while Oberth used his expert knowledge of rocketry to insist on a launching platform and a multi-stage rocket. The straps used to hold people in place in zero gravity are also pretty close to the Velcro used today, even if, at the time, people thought zero gravity only existed in a brief moment between celestial bodies. Indeed, the science is what would eventually get the film banned in Germany during World War II. When the Nazis were crafting their state-of-the-art missile system, headlined by the deadly V-2 rocket, Woman in the Moon was considered so close to reality that the Third Reich feared it would reveal state secrets. Many of the people who worked on the science behind the film, especially Werner von Braun, would also go on to build the V-2 rocket which, with its black-and-white design, looks an awful lot like the movie's space airship, not to mention the Woman in the Moon logo painted onto the side. Of course, Woman in the Moon doesn't get everything right, as rockets don't need to be submerged in water for stability, and sustained g-forces during launch would prove to be far tamer than the math suggested, but in many respects, it manages to be even more correct about what a trip to the moon would look like than even 1950's Destination Moon, which didn't use a multi-stage rocket or liquid fuel. Woman in the Moon released in October of 1929 to much fanfare, with even Albert Einstein present at the event. 
While Oberth was unable to have his rocket launch that day, accounts differ as to why, he was eventually able to pull it off some time later, without as much pomp and circumstance. Heavily promoted as the first sci-fi film based on real science, it would go on to have a reputation as one of Germany's last great silent films. It was a financial disappointment, though not nearly as disastrous as Metropolis had been, and so Fritz Lang never worked for Ufa again. His subsequent brief tenure with Nero film produced two of his greatest works, though, M and the Testament of Dr. Mabuse, before he left Germany during the rise of Hitler in the early 1930s. For more about why he left and why his wife, Thea von Arbo, is seen as deeply problematic, I discuss that in more depth in my review of Metropolis. It's one of my earliest videos on this channel, though, so you'll have to excuse the lackluster quality. Anyway, getting back to Woman in the Moon, I do think it is unfairly overlooked as one of the greats of early science fiction cinema, too often overshadowed by the more memorable spectacle of Metropolis, or the rise of early sci-fi horror in America in the early 1930s. Even I am partially guilty of downplaying its significance when talking about the likes of Destination Moon, a groundbreaking movie in its own right that almost certainly owes its entire existence to Fritz Lang's effort two decades prior. One could easily trace an entire subgenre of space-bound hard sci-fi film that includes the likes of 2001, Gravity and the Martian, to Women in the Moon. And for lovers of those kinds of movies, myself included, it's important to appreciate where it all started. Personally, though, I will admit it's not as eminently rewatchable as Metropolis, its more fantastic big budget cousin. None of the male characters are all that interesting, and the story suffers from an identity crisis, where the first half feels like an unresolved spy thriller, while the second half becomes the space adventure audiences expect. However, Long's mastery of film is on full display, and since the original negatives survived to be digitally remastered in 4K, it looks incredible for a silent film, far better than even Metropolis. You can see Long's cinematography and montage in high resolution, and it's far easier to notice subtle touches, like the fact that when the rocket launches, the shadows of the handle straps loom like a hangman's noose over the two characters ultimately fated to die. The romantic melodrama sometimes rises to telenovela levels of cheese, which I guess is fitting for the moon, but the main attraction, aside from the science, is easily the titular woman herself, Frida. She is a character that absolutely refuses to have her agency taken from her, standing strong and powerful against her male counterparts. And in my mind, she is the true hero of the story, not the grouchy and morally uncertain Helios. Say what you want about Thea von Arbo, but her female characters are some of the most well-written in all of cinema. As for themes, the film clearly has something to say about greed and money. Greed is the professor's undoing, and the idea of a small cabal of people controlling all business and industry in such a way that they are able to keep idealists and great thinkers from holding any sway is a great bit of cartoonish hyperbole that no doubt resonates with a certain type of viewer. Other than that, I think the movie is just about determination and the spirit of pushing boundaries, of being willing to test ideas others denounce as crazy, or to choose drastic action to get what you want out of life. Regardless of how you view it, though, Woman in the Moon remains a sci-fi classic. And that's all for today, my fellow Earthlings. What's your favorite hard sci-fi film? Let me know in the comments, and while you're there, once again, hit those buttons I keep talking about. Thank you for watching, and until next time, when a giant radioactive creature not named Godzilla will attack the Golden Gate Bridge, this is the Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love. As long as you're not hurting anybody.